You're watching Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast, and this is episode number 64. Welcome back, everyone, to today's episode number 65 of Tim Topham TV, where we get to hang out with Dennis Alexander. How cool is that? A man that probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. Uh, suffice to say that we had a great time. I actually met Dennis uh, last year at the NCKP conference and we hung out and got to know each other. It was great fun. And so I was really pleased that he was able to find the time in his busy schedule to come on board and not only chat with us about composing, um, creativity, the importance of improvising, um, but also play us some of his favorite pieces of his own, which I thought was really, really cool. Now, uh, today's show notes are going to be at timtopham.com slash episode 65. And I did want to remind you too that you can get transcripts of all episodes of the Tim Topham TV podcast from episode 50 when I started doing transcripts for free and completely available on screen at the show notes page. And you can even download a PDF of the transcript too. So for those of you who like reading things instead of listening or watching them, then make sure you do check out our transcripts on the show notes page. As a reminder too, I'm currently offering $100 off membership of my Inner Circle community. That's $100 off an annual membership uh, for as long as you remain a member. And the code you need for that is TTTV Podcast. And it's really, really easy to sign up and find out everything you need to know and where to use that code if you head to timtopham.com slash community. And a very final reminder, if you're listening to this on the day of release then and you're in Perth in Western Australia, then we are running our Transform Your Teaching live event. Paul Myatt and I will be coming over to Perth uh, this Sunday. So if you're listening to this live and it's that weekend, which is uh, November 5th or thereabouts, then make sure you check out timtopham.com slash transform for all the details. Now, as I said, we probably don't need to introduce Dennis Alexander too much, but I will give you a quick little bit of background about him. You've probably taught his music to your students and maybe even played it yourself. Since his affiliation with Alfred Publishing in 1986 as a composer and clinician, Dennis Alexander has earned an international reputation as one of North America's most prolific and popular composers of educational piano music for students at all levels. Professor Alexander retired from his position at the University of Montana in May 1996, where he taught piano and piano pedagogy for 24 years. Upon moving to California, he has taught privately in addition to serving on the faculties of Cal State Fullerton and Cal State Northridge. He currently lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he maintains an active composing and touring schedule for Alfred Publishing Company. And you'll be able to find out everything that he's doing and has going on and what he's planning for the future in this episode. I do hope you enjoy my interview, chat and performance from Dennis Alexander. Well, Dennis Alexander, I am so excited that you're able to come on my show today. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it was brilliant meeting you uh, last year at NCKP. I met you and Bill um, and we hung out for a little bit. We chatted music. Uh, I think you were even interviewed on one of my, my podcasts back in episode 11 when I did a rundown on the NCKP event. Please feel free to check that if you're listening and want to know about the NCKP, the National Conference on Keyboard Pedagogy. Great event. It was really great to meet you. Um, and uh, it was kind of weird, actually, because you're a little bit of a hero for me as a as a student and a teacher. Uh, I, I played your music for, since I was a child, and uh, and here I was hanging out with you and having a chat. Do you do you get uh, do you get fans coming up to you and sort of being a bit wowed sometimes? Yeah, it, it's always great fun to go to these conferences. You see teachers you haven't seen for many many years. And it's always fun to reconnect, and it's fun to meet new people like you. Yeah, <laughs> it was good. Was fun to, it was fun to see you in action there too. Congratulations, you're doing great, and it was it was fun to see the excitement that you generated in your sessions there. Oh, thank you, appreciate it. It was great to have you sitting in the back. I remember uh, remember seeing you and some of the other guys there. <laughs> it was brilliant. Um, so, look, look, I'm really interested in uh, chatting with you just generally a little bit about composing. Uh, and also about teaching and maybe hearing some of your pieces because I know you've got the piano there. I, I'm, I'm hoping you might even be able to play something for us a bit later on. Um, but how did you originally get into composing? Did you start as a teacher and then move into that? What was the story? Tim, I 
um, I always aspired to be a teacher. Uh, that was my main interest uh, when I went to college, uh, and I attended the University of Kansas. I was actually given a scholarship to Oberlin and ended up going to uh, University of Kansas for summer school and fell in love with the place and ended up staying there. Instead, I had a, a wonderful, wonderful teacher, and I just really planned to be a teacher and performer. So I majored in piano performance. I, I never actually studied composition. Uh, it was the furthest thing from my mind. Uh, <laughs> it's funny that, how that happens in life, isn't it? I know. I know. And I, uh, I studied, of course, uh, very extensively theory and oral perception and counterpoint and uh, all, all those things that are required. But I never took a composition class. And um, it was not until I was teaching at the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana. Uh, that's where I taught from 1972 until 1996 uh, when I retired from there. Um, and it was actually quite by accident that I got involved in competition. I met um, Amanda Vick Lethko. You might know that name. Um, she and uh, Willard Palmer were, along with Morty Manis, were the co-authors of Alfred Basic Piano Library. And I, I had known Amanda Bick uh, from uh, some performances that I did in Texas. And uh, she actually uh, was in Montana in 1986 doing workshops on the method that was just really starting to take off at the time. And she asked me if I would be willing to be a clinician for Alfred uh, to help she and Willard promote the piano method. And that's really how I started um, my career as a composer, <laughs> as a clinician first. And I, I was showing the method the very first summer, and Morty Manis came to a workshop and took me to lunch, and he asked me if I would be willing to write the duet books that correlated with the method, because Willard Palmer didn't have time to write them. And I confessed to him at the time that I had never written a thing in my life, <laughs> that I, I had taught piano pedagogy for years. I knew the repertoire. I knew the teaching repertoire very, very well. And I somehow knew that I could do this because I had, you know, in college, I had played in nightclubs. I improvised. I, um, I played by ear. I, I somehow just knew that I could compose. Uh, but Morty asked me, uh, well, why haven't you ever composed? And my answer was very simple. I said, because nobody ever asked me. <laughs> <laughs> simple as that. So I ended up writing those duet books for Alfred, and they ended up being very successful. And um, thus, my career as a composer started quite by accident. How interesting. What a great, what a great story. I love it. And so, yeah, so when you... They, they just all assumed that I studied composition intensely when I was in college, and I've never had a lesson in uh, composing, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think it's great to hear it because we know that there's lots of teachers out there who perhaps haven't gone through a formal training process. Um, yes. But to me, that doesn't make them any less... Uh, less effective teachers or great motivators or inspirational people. Uh, often the people who don't have that formal training can be absolutely brilliant. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I have known lots of teachers who um, didn't have anything uh, or had almost no training in college and are wonderful, wonderful teachers. And then I've known teachers who have doctorates uh, who are not so great. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. see the whole gamut. Uh, it, I think it all has to do with personality, with your interest, your creativity, um, your personality, and all of those things go together to make uh, a great teacher um, and, and sometimes a, a good composer. Mm. Well, so you, you, you said that you naturally played by ear, you improvised. Yeah. Did your, when you learned piano as a, uh, a student, did your teachers encourage that or show you anything to help with that? Or did you kind of do that you know, naughtily on the side? 
I often wonder what I would have done as a child had I had access to the technology that we have today. You know, back in, in, in the days when I was a child and taking lessons, uh, I was seven years old, and that was, let's see, I'll give you my exact age. <laughs> um, I, uh, I was let's see, taking lessons, seven years old, that would have been 54. Something, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, that would have been 1954. In those days, we didn't have um, the kind of technology that we have today. I was very, very fortunate that my first teacher was so wonderful. She improvised herself. And um, when I would sit down to play my little five-finger pieces, she would make up wonderful little duet parts to go along with my uh, solos. And, of course, I could not believe how wonderful I sounded <laughs> when my teacher played along with me. So sometimes I then would be inspired from her to improvise myself during the week. I would sometimes come back um, playing an amazing version of Clementi C Major Sonatina <laughs> just to see if she was really listening. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, she would chuckle and say, um, well, that was very clever, but don't you dare do that at the recital or I'll kill you. <laughs> so you, or you, had, you had created your own version of it, had you? Oh, of course. Yes, yeah. I loved that sort of thing. Yeah. And then uh, when I uh, was growing up, too, my, my parents loved music and they were always playing the big bands on, on uh, phonographs, records. And, and, of course, I loved listening to that. So I would hear those pieces and then go to the piano and, and play my version of those pieces. So I, I had a good ear when I was little and, and so I was very lucky that way. But I was also fortunate that my teacher never discouraged me mm. from playing by ear. Some teachers do that. And I think it's very unfortunate when that happens because you never know uh, when a young child is going to be very creative and maybe uh, be an aspiring composer. Um, I certainly didn't know when I was seven years old, nor did my teacher, that I would someday be making uh, a living as a composer. I'd like to think that times are changing and fewer teachers would be putting the brakes on students that are showing creative sides uh, size to their personality. Would you agree with that in what you've seen around the world? I, I think more and more because of technology uh, and because of the emphasis on uh, pedagogy programs around uh, the country that teachers are very, um, very much encouraging young people to be more and more creative. And I love seeing that. I, uh, to me, it, it's very sad when young students are, are not allowed to play uh, popular music or jazz uh, if they're only given very, very strict regimens of, of classical repertoire because kids today like everything mm. uh, they hear everything and and they're always wanting to play with their friends so i think it's important for teachers to have that flexibility and and i'm glad to see that more and more teachers are doing that mm. what are some other important things you think piano teachers should be doing in lessons to encourage creativity in their students well i think other than I, just I, in supporting them if they're yeah. showing their own signs, is there anything they can do to kind of drive it or push it or help? Yeah. Well, I know some teachers who really encourage composition with young students. Um, we're fortunate that we have so uh, so many avenues today that teachers can choose uh, to help them teach composition to their students. Um, my good friend and colleague at Alfred Wynn and Rossi uh, has some great books out now that are called uh, Composition Toolbox. Uh, they come in six levels that teachers can use to encourage students to compose uh, pieces. What was um, her name again? Win and Win and Rossi, R O S S I. Beautiful. We'll pop a link on the show notes page. Uh, with Alfred um, Music Publishing, and mm -hmm. uh, these books came out a couple of years ago. They're they're in six levels, and they're really wonderful uh, for for young students to. Uh, to use and uh, gives them all kinds of ideas for helping them create wonderful melodies, form, uh, and, and uh, of course, bigger pieces as they move through each level. Um, we also have just fantastic apps today, as you know, mm. 
um, uh, Lila Viss, uh, my friend in Colorado. Uh, I, I know you know Lila. I love Lila. Uh, yeah, she's great. And she's been just wonderful to provide teachers with uh, lots and lots of ideas on, on different uh, apps that are available for helping uh, students with um, all kinds of aspects of, of mu uh, musicianship, um, with uh, oral perception, um, with improvisation, mm -hmm. uh, chord, chording techniques. Um, there's just so much going on today in the in the world of piano pedagogy that's very exciting. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? See, it is an exciting time, I think. So that, that can't help but influence a lot of teachers to get their their kids more involved in uh, being creative. I I wish that more and more teachers would would have a Cavanova in their studio uh, alongside their uh, their acoustical piano. Um, I know I used to uh, when I was teaching in California privately. After I left the University of Montana, um, I always had a clavinova next to my uh, grand. And very often, if a student uh, came to a lesson unprepared, or they called and said, oh, Mr. A, I can't be there this week because I uh, was too busy with volleyball. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, oh, no, you come to your lesson and, we, and we'll, we'll do something uh, interesting that'll be helpful. And sometimes a student would come in and they would... Uh, sit down at the Clavinova, and I might teach them how to sequence uh, one of their pieces and create a wonderful little um, uh, orchestral version of a, a piece that they're working on. And that was very inspiring to the kids. Mm. Uh, they had so much fun doing it. And, and sequencing, you mean uh, laying down like a, a bass line and then laying yes. down tracks, yeah? Right, yeah. right, right. And so the Clavinova, you can do that straight on. It's just Oh, yeah, carefully. it's so easy. It's so easy to do, and, and the instrument just, uh, it's, it's so exciting for kids to hear their pieces orchestrated mm. uh, and, and very, very motivational at the same time. So those, those kinds of things are wonderful tools for, for any teacher today who has the interest in doing it. Mm. So I gathered you've retired now from the full-time teaching and pro and composing. I oh, know you're still composing, aren't you? I am. I yeah. I I'm trying to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so, I but I just I just finished uh, doing a student uh, concerto. Uh, oh, it's in three movements, uh, and uh, I'm not sure when that'll be out, but I know uh, I'll I'll be getting the proofs very very soon. Fantastic. And uh, and after that, I'm not sure. I. You know, at this point, my library is is quite extensive <laughs> and all different levels. So I'm I'm trying to take some time to smell the roses right now. Good for you. I think we can all say, yeah, I think you've earned it. Um, what what does a week look for uh, look like for you now? Then, what does a typical day look like? Yeah, a typical uh, day, a few days. Yeah. Well, it used to be that that every single day I had deadlines. To meet uh, for composing, especially when we were working on the piano method, uh, Alfred's premier piano course. But now that that is all finished, um, I I find that my days are are much more relaxing. Um, <laughs> I, I I like to sometimes just sit down at the piano and and play for fun, uh, old repertoire that I used to do, or uh, popular music, or uh, I, I have been working very hard recently, uh, getting my uh, chops back in order. Right. Uh, I, I did two recitals this past weekend with a wonderful violinist. Oh wow! Uh, uh, here and one in Albuquerque and one at a university um, in the eastern part of the state. Uh, we did a Mozart sonata, the Cesar Franck sonata, mm. and uh, some pieces by Bloch. So it was fun for me to to get really back into serious practicing, which I haven't had time to do yeah. you know, uh, with all the composing I was doing. Um, I also do some volunteer work at a hospital uh, one day a week. I, um, I really want to spend time sitting down at the Clavinova and uh, getting a lot more proficient at sequencing and maybe creating more MIDI accompaniments for some of my music. Uh, that's something I, I want to spend time doing. Yeah, I like to read. Uh, so I, I, I find that 
uh, in my kind of semi-retired state right now. <laughs> the days fly by very quickly, and I don't know uh, how the hours get so filled up, but they always come out <laughs> yeah. to do so. <laughs> I can't believe my my parents uh, have retired, but uh, you know they're busier than ever. It seems I have to book time to to see them weeks in advance. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. But it's yeah. also great, you know. How sad would it be if you retired and not, you know, you don't do anything at all? Yeah, and I, I also spend, I, I will admit, probably too much time on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you are prolific on Facebook, I must I, say. I, I, I like to see what everybody else is thinking and doing, and and that's always kind of fun. And and uh, I, I'm trying to catch up on reading uh, things like Clivier Companion. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, AMT magazine. So I, I try and keep current as much as possible with what's happening out there in the in the world of music and and uh, the world in general. And you're still doing um, the odd masterclass um, and some live kind of events and things too. Is that right? Yes. Oh, yeah. I am. Yeah. yeah. I, in fact, I just uh, came back. Uh, I was a week ago. I was at the University of South Carolina uh, doing a two day residency there with Scott Price. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I just recently had a wonderful podcast with. Mm. I enjoyed um, uh, reading that that transcript. It was very interesting. Um, yeah, and he it had was great. so many great ideas. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. wonderful. Uh, it was very fun to be back there. I I did uh, some work with college students. I did a master class with some of them. I I did a master class with young students. Uh, several lectures to uh, masters and doctoral students in pedagogy. Uh, they have a very wonderful program there, mm. University. Um, I'm um, I'm going to be going out to California uh, at the end, of, you know, the middle of October. Uh, we're going to be in Spain. We leave for Spain on Tuesday for two weeks oh. for a nice vacation, and then as soon as I get back, two days later, I I go out to Long Beach, California, uh, to do some presentations out there for their uh, state conference. Yep. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing Marvin Blickenstaff at that conference. Um, I've yep. known Marvin for many, many years, and we'll be sharing uh, several uh, presentations there. And then uh, I'll be going to Chicago uh, in early December to speak to the uh, Chicago Music Teachers Association. Which I look forward to. <laughs> I'm exhausted listening to it. It's, um, yeah, definitely only a semi-retirement if if <laughs> it's just bordering on the start of it, maybe just because you've given yourself some holiday time, which I think is great. Well, you know, I, I often laugh about it all because compared uh, to my years when I was teaching at the University of Montana, um, and I was there from 72 to 96. And then for the last 10 years that I was there, I was writing full time for Alfred at the same, at, at the same time. So when I look back on those days and, and realize how many hats I was wearing and how much performing I was doing and how much teaching uh, at the university and teaching uh, young students on the side as well, uh, and then going home sometimes at 10 o'clock at night after faculty were recital, uh, or student recitals, and then starting to compose from 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, Today feels very relaxed. Feels, feels relaxed compared to that, I can imagine. <laughs> now, you recently published a book uh, of rote pieces or co-published, um, yes. which which I, I think is is great because I think the mood now is changing. There was this this view that if you teach something by rote or if students just copy you playing something, that's bad teaching. Um, and I'm glad that that view is starting to change. I, I personally think rote teaching is great. It's just one of the tools you use in, in your teaching studio. Why did you feel it important to bring out a book of rote pieces? I actually I did this book with a very good friend um, here in Albuquerque um, and a wonderful pianist by the name of Amy Greer. And it was actually Amy's idea mm -hmm. uh, to do this book, and she – uh, asked me if I would be interested in doing it with her. And um, when I, I spoke to my publisher, um, they were uh, very interested in having us do this. And it ended up being a very fun project. I, um, as, as Amy does too, uh, we both feel very strongly that there's a lot to be learned from rope teaching. 
and uh, it's gotten a bad rap, uh, I think, over the years. Sometimes uh, teachers think that, that rote teaching means that you won't learn to read music, mm. and uh, nothing could be further from the truth. But uh, we, we did these pieces uh, in the book together. Um, she did some of them. I did some of them. I did most of the accompaniments uh, for the rote pieces as well. Uh, in fact, it was interesting just today. Um, someone posted on my page a video of a student uh, playing a little piece called Desert Rose, uh, and uh, it was fun to see uh, that video, and I wrote back immediately and congratulated the student who had had just six weeks of lessons. Oh, it's brilliant. And yeah. Playing a beautiful piece uh, with their teacher on the piano, and uh, so it's great fun to see how teachers are using the book, and a lot of teachers are excited about it. Mm. And uh, it's been very gratifying. To and that's the thing: that. the um, the student can have big, quick wins playing hard-sounding, beautiful music without slogging away at it for months. That's kind of the point, in my opinion, anyway. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. right. Lots of you know, lots of students if they start lessons in the fall, and if the teacher has a, uh, maybe a Christmas recital or a, a fall recital after maybe just three months. Uh, if that student plays, tries to play something from their method book, they might not sound, you know, uh, so great. Yep. <laughs> they, they have a, a really fun rote piece, which they learned uh, by rote and learned it rather quickly. Uh, they'll be playing things that encompass a much wider range on the instrument, uh, and it'll, it's going to sound more impressive, mm. uh, and they'll be more motivated. Uh, to have pieces like that. Yeah, particularly when they're first learning and maybe they're only using a couple of notes and a couple of fingers yeah. to suddenly be able to, at the same time as they're learning to read those simple notes, be able to play something expressive and wide-ranging. It's just great fun. I'm actually using the book right now with a, a new adult beginner. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, and, and he's just you know really enjoying uh, a couple of the pieces that we're working on. Um, I, I gave him... A piece called Jubilation uh, just uh, last week to start, and and he's uh, he he came back uh, one week later and had most of it figured out, and he was very proud of himself. <laughs> I bet, yeah, it is. It's it's great. That's uh, I call it those quick wins. They're great fun. Yeah. So what's um what's what's your process for composing? I love asking composers this uh, because everyone seems to do it differently. Do you, are you a melody person or are you a harmonic person or is it something completely different or does it all depend? You know, it, it all depends. Uh, there are so many factors involved. When I was working on uh, composing the pieces for the piano method, uh, in that particular situation, I, uh, I was given very strict parameters that we had to stay within uh, uh, depending on which level and, and which part uh, of the book uh, and then how the pedagogy was, was being presented at the time. So in situations like that, I might be uh, given instructions by the pedagogy team on the method to write a uh, 16 or 24 bar piece in a certain key that uses a certain rhythm pattern. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so that's how I would would start the piece. Um, I'm actually very melody oriented by nature. Mm -hmm. I, I love beautiful melodies. And so um, a lot of the pieces that I've written for my own library are pieces that were um, inspired by a melody that came into my head. Um, and uh, I recall when I first started composing for Alfred, um, in those early days, I would sometimes, I, I'd be hearing so much music in my head, it made me crazy sometimes. <laughs> I, I would wake up at night and, and hear something, and I'd have to, to jot it down. Um, on a so that you could get it out of your head. Right, right, because I couldn't get it out of my head, and I knew I'd forget it. It was so good, I didn't want to forget it, you know? <laughs> of course. So I, I would jot it down, and, and then the next morning, I'd finish the piece. Uh, sometimes... I, um, I'll get a rhythm pattern in my head that I really like. And a piece 
evolves uh, from that rhythm pattern. Sometimes it, it, I'll, I'll have a good title that I really want to use, and the piece evolves from the title. Oh, so wow. there are just so many different ways that, that pieces evolve. You know, when, when you write as much music as I've written over the years, um, you, you really have to draw from many, many different sources. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm really inspired by nature. Uh, sometimes I, I would take my dog for a walk and, and, um, while we're walking, I would get something in my head going and immediately come home and, and jot it down. Yeah. So, uh, living in Montana all those years, I, I was surrounded by gorgeous scenery. Mm. Even here in, in New Mexico, uh, we have beautiful, beautiful places, uh, that are inspiring. And, and, uh, when I travel, um, I, I see things that inspire me and give me ideas, you know, for new pieces. So, uh, the, the inspiration comes from so many different sources. Uh, sometimes my, my own students, uh, might inspire me, uh, you know, by how they're playing or a piece that they're working on might give me an idea for something, uh, original. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, and every composer I've ever asked that question to, yeah, it's always the same. It could be anything. So different. Anything. Yeah. 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 So I would love to know, you know, you have so much music out there. Do you have a couple of favorites and is there any chance you could play a couple for us? Or is that asking a bit much? <laughs> sure. You know, when people ask me, you know, what, what are two or three of your favorite pieces that you've ever written? That's, that's like, um, picking your favorite child, you know, <laughs> be children. <laughs> yeah, but that's very hard to do because I have a lot of favorites um, in the repertoire. You know, I mean, I I think I've written something like two or three thousand pieces. Oh my goodness! Uh, over the years, and and um, I I can't even remember some of them. Sometimes I'll hear <laughs> students in a recital play one of my pieces, and and honestly, I. I, I asked Come. myself, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you know and, you've written a lot of music when that happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know. Yeah, um, one of my biggest fears is 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 writing something that I've written before. <laughs> 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 that happened. That actually happened a couple of years ago. I turned a piece in that I was so proud of, <laughs> and um, my editor called me. She said. You know, Dennis, this is almost identical to a piece you wrote about 25 <laughs> years ago. And I was shocked, and I went back, and, and she told me what the piece was. And I found it, and I, and I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, and this she's, is really getting right. bad. <laughs> because, you know, we, we keep these some of these ideas in our heads and, and in our subconscious. Once in a while, they'll come back to haunt us. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you what. That's an now, edit. That's an edit to my I, finger uh, on the pulse. I I, I have um, several pieces. That, you know, I have two or three here. If you'd like to hear them, I, uh, I, I know. Favorites. I know viewers and listeners would love to hear you play a couple of your pieces. It'd be great. Okay, okay. I hope that the uh, I'm, I'm going to move this around so that you can yep. see the keyboard. Uh, I don't know. It, it, can you see me? All right. I can. I'm, I can. Yeah. I'm, I don't know how well the sound will come through, but uh, we'll give it a shot. It should be okay. Um, let's see. Let me let me do this. Now. This is this is uh, a real favorite. It's, it's a big, a big favorite uh, in the library right now. Uh, it's called Rhythm Roulette. Oh, I know this one. Yes, uh, love it. It's a real it's a real motivational piece. I've uh, seen a lot of students play it on recitals, and uh, it it does it it sells very well. So I I know that. Um, Teachers are, are teaching it, yeah. and they, they enjoy it. But it, it's a piece that it's, it's what I call a pattern piece. Um, so it has lots of, of uh, repetition uh, in different areas of the keyboard. Uh, it has a little uh, four note motif uh, that that um, uh, oh, you know what? I have to turn my piano back on. <laughs> and you it goes off to play when I let it sit for a while. So it, it's it's um, it's warming up right now and uh anyway i was just gonna say that um it has a left hand melody all the way through that uh i, I like to do this sort of thing with a lot of 
pieces, uh, write something that, that sounds harder yeah. than it is. Yep. And, and uh, this is the secret, I think, for a lot of, of um, good pieces that the students really latch on to. If they, uh, if they sound really good and it doesn't take them forever to learn it, Mm. Uh, it's usually a, a winning competition. Absolutely. Uh, Dennis, you're not going to believe this, but I was doing some live training just yesterday here in Melbourne and I referenced this very piece because I was talking about sure. pattern. Yeah, this very piece. That is really weird. We haven't planned this, people who are listening. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I was I was talking about um, using, because it's so uh, caudal and pattern-based, it's a great teaching piece for helping students understand the harmonic uh, structure of it and the key sure. and the chords that are being used. So listen out as, as Dennis is playing. It's a great, it's a fun piece, but it's also got lots of great pedagogy in it. Okay, uh, here's Rhythm Roulette. All right. composers play their own music it's brilliant yeah, well it's, it's a real fun piece to, to practice i think mm. uh, like you know uh earlier in the piece they have this little motif <laughs> which always starts off with a black key mm. and goes to white keys uh, so it starts on c sharp and then goes up to g sharp and then c sharp again and once they learn that little pattern at the end of the piece they have uh, the same exact pattern on the last line with, with a yeah. little first with the right hand, which makes it easy. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's fun. great. It's but it, Dennis, it's such great writing. You know, it's it's <laughs> I, you, you make it look so easy. But I, I know for people listening, just to to wonder how you've done that is is awe inspiring for us non composers. But I, I really do love that piece, and I love the simplicity of the um, da, 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 that that accenting. Yeah. In one two three, one two three, one two one. It's just in four four. But yes. just that slight, that little pattern there, and this is something that teachers can use with their students when composing right. to make things sound more interesting. It suddenly brings right. it alive, doesn't it? Right. Well, it's a little motive that you could even get to a student and ask them to improvise their own melody. Mm. See, see what you can come up with. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, with something totally, totally different. Would you like to hear something totally contrasting with that? Let, let's do that. And you better tell people what book they could find that piece in, the Rhythm Roulette. Okay. This, uh, this piece, uh, Rhythm Roulette, is actually a sheet solo. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, it's a sheet solo. And um, one thing that teachers might want to know is, you know, I have a very extensive personal website. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they just go to DennisAlexander.com, uh, they can see uh, my entire library. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I have, I have a link, uh, a, my a compositions link, and everything is organized by um, levels, and uh, whether they're sheet solos or collections. I have new releases at the very top of uh, that uh, list of, of categories, uh, and uh, I have... Uh, at the bottom of that list, there's a whole section on Christmas music as well. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers can hear me play uh, all of my sheet solos. So uh, if they want to hear me play that on the website, they just simply go to DennisAlexander.com. Oh, Dennis, and, I thought this was an exclusive. Yeah, and, and yeah, and, <laughs> and look for uh, for intermediate sheet solos. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and uh, they'll find Rhythm Roulette right there. Right. Uh, they'll see a, a, the first page of the music as well. And uh, if they uh, if they don't happen to have a music dealer close to them, uh, they can order the music off my website as well. Fantastic. Oh, that's brilliant. All right. Thank yeah. you for that. What have you got? What have you got next? Um, this is great. It's like my little own little concert with Dylan San Alexander. <laughs> Uh, did the sound come through okay? Yeah, it, sa- that? it sounded great. Okay. Good. Um, I am a romantic at heart. I I love uh, the romantic repertoire. I've always loved uh, music by Chopin, Brahms, Rachmaninoff, Liszt. I played those composers so much when I was giving um, solo recitals. And um, so in my writing, uh, my, my some of my favorite pieces to write are pieces in a romantic style. So I, I have three collections uh, called Especially in Romantic Style, mm-hmm. and um, uh, they're all intermediate levels, uh, early intermediate, mid-intermediate, and late intermediate. Um, this is a piece from book three, which is the late intermediate, uh, and it's called The Promise of Spring. Right. And uh, it goes like this. Bravo, Dennis. Really lovely. That's brilliant Thanks. piece. I haven't heard Thanks. that one. That's new to me. Uh, that's one of my favorites. I, um, I, I have a lot of 
uh, very romantic style pieces um, at all different levels. And uh, in fact, one of the very first pieces I ever wrote for Alfred uh, was uh, that style of piece, but in a five finger position. Right. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. it's your accomplishment. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, so that series was called what? Uh, especially in romantic style. Beautiful. Yeah, great. Well, yeah, uh, I'll I've try got... and add some links to these on our show notes page. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a whole especially series. There's especially for boys, especially for girls, especially in jazzy style, especially for Christmas. Yeah, I've used uh, the especially for boys volumes one and two before. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, that's real. That's really lovely. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. Um, how are we going for time? We're uh, looking all right. There might be time for one more if you happen to have one ready. Um, otherwise, we might start wrapping it up. But uh, did you have one other in your repertoire? Oh, I am enjoying listening to those. Yeah. Oh, totally different. <laughs> oh, let's finish. With, let's finish with one more then. Okay, if you have time. Yep, let's um, do it. Let's do it. I, uh, teachers sometimes have asked me, how many Takatas have you written? Uh, because I've written a lot, yeah. uh, all different levels. And I finally uh, made a list of them, and then uh, they're on my website. Oh, brilliant. So, okay. uh, if teachers uh, want to uh, see all the different Takatas that I have, uh, they can go to my website. And under Teaching Tips, um, the, the newest article there is a listing of my Takatas and, and where they're Great all looking. Them. Great. Right. Uh, this is a piece, this is a piece called Rhythm Akata. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, it was, it was um, a piece that I wrote for the um, Musical Arts Center of San Antonio, Texas. Um, I have a friend down there uh, who started that school. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, program. And they had me down there a couple of years ago, and, and I wrote this piece as a surprise for them. Oh, really? And it's been another uh, popular month. Lots of fun. Great. Kids would love that one. Yeah, it's a bummer. That yeah. is great. All over the keyboard. Yeah, all over the keyboards. Again, patterns. Do ta 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 ta. Great. Love like the this. rhythms. Yeah. 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 Very rhythmical and, and uh, lots of rests that they have to observe. So rests are are golden. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I try to tell my I try to tell my <laughs> students that you know the silence is just as important as the sound. Uh, it doesn't exactly. always go through, but but uh, it's so important. Uh, look, it's been brilliant chatting with you today. Thank you so much for sharing your life of music and your compositions and playing for us today. It's been brilliant. I really appreciate your including me in your wonderful broadcast and I wish you the best. I will look forward, hopefully, to seeing you at NCKP Absolutely. next Absolutely. Yep, yep, I'm there. We're going to go out for dinner or something like that. We must uh, must catch up properly right. again. After have to uh, have a meal together. Yep, absolutely. Last we'll do that. Time. Yeah, okay. and for those of you who haven't met Dennis yet, come along to NCKP next year um, because you you know you're you're a person that will just chat and you know share things with anyone there. So uh, yeah, I have to admit that one of the um, the biggest highlights of of my career 
was last summer when they presented me with that lifetime achievement oh, award. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was just you know it, it's uh, it it was so uh, so wonderful to be recognized by my peers. Mm. Uh, have so many wonderful friends in the business, and so so many brilliant composers out there and teachers. Uh, whom I've known for so many years, and to have many of them there and, and supporting me, um, and Ingrid Clarefield, mm, my mm. friend, that worked with me. Uh, it was a very, very special evening. I'll never forget it. So yeah, that's great. Uh, that you were at that uh, conference, and yeah. like I, said, I hope to see you next summer. Absolutely, hundred percent, well deserved. Uh, and just a quick reminder: your website is dennisalexander.com. Yes. And I assume your music can also be found, you're published by Alfred. So alfred.com, is it, over in America? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. All of my music uh, has, has been published by Alfred. I have exclusive with them. Great. Well, they've chosen Thanks. a great great man and a great composer to uh, have on their catalog. So <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> and I'll see you soon. All right. I hope to come back to Australia. Well, yeah. When, when are we going to get you over here? Oh, it's been, well, you know, there's some talk about the Australia, uh, Australasian uh, Pedagogy Conference. Uh, I'm not sure yet if I'll be there, but there's some interest uh, in having that happen. So oh, brilliant. maybe I'll see you there. Oh, that would be great. Well, if you, if you do that, then we'll definitely catch up over here too. It's been nine years <laughs> since I've been there. So. Oh, has it really? All right. Well, we've got to get you over here again. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Dennis. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. It's Tim here again. Uh, thank you very much for listening to or watching today's episode. I uh, do hope you got something out of it. I put them together to be as relevant and useful to you in your studio and your teaching uh, as possible. So uh, do let me know your feedback. If you've got any questions, uh, comments, critique, whatever it is, you can email me at admin at timtopham.com. Now, before we go, I did want to mention a few little reminders. Firstly, if you're looking for transcripts, Transcripts of every episode from episode 50 onwards are available at the show notes page and you can either view the transcript on screen or you can download a PDF that you can use uh, to research and um, refer to. To find the show notes of any episode of Tim Topham TV, just type in timtopham.com slash episode and then the number. So e.g. timtopham.com slash episode 20. Now, as you may have heard, I am offering currently you guys, my loyal podcast listeners, some of the most dedicated teachers I know, a $100 discount off annual membership of my inner circle. The code you need to access that is TTTV podcast, all one word, and the place you're going to find out more about what you get for membership, the benefits, hear some testimonials of current members. The place you go is timtopham.com slash community. Finally, if you have a suggestion for a guest, I would always love to hear about it. A lot of you guys have some fantastic connections. So if you're thinking of anyone that would be really cool to interview, please email me, admin at timtopham.com. We'll get to me and uh, I look forward to hearing from you and we'll see you in the next episode. If the idea of a piano teacher's community where you get to access the best educational resources, rub shoulders with expert teachers from around the world, and have immediate access to feedback for any of your questions, then Inner Circle membership is for you. The Inner Circle is my private community of piano teachers from across the globe who share a commitment to creating and delivering the most inspiring, modern, and progressive learning experiences for their students. Membership is now open, so head to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more and get involved today. I can't wait to see you on the inside.